So for you guys, Drew is the head of the Scotch Whiskey Society in, uh, in South Florida. Outstanding. Welcome, Drew. And then you've got uh, Shay, uh, uh, which is probably the foremost expert in chocolate. So ah. if you don't know about chocolate, Shay is the lady. She's uh, in is, is this the chocolate we talked about before, Ben? No, different chocolate. She's just okay. an all around just expert. Got it. And there's the probably good reasons why you're on a uh, scotch uh, seminar here. <laughs> well, hopefully, hopefully everybody will have a uh, walk away with at least uh, one or two answers, qu uh, questions answered, and maybe even some that they didn't even know they had. So that's, that's always my goal for, for these particular tastings. So yeah. what do you say we pour a little of this? Ready? Just while people are coming in, before we're really ready, we probably should, you know, limber up. We're gonna, over here, we're gonna start with just a little nip of the 12 year, just get loose, you know. Sounds perfect to me. Usually after the first dram, people will start to open up. They actually turn on their cameras. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is the closest we're gonna get for at least a little while. Hopefully not too much longer, but for a little while before we uh, uh, get back out there. And I know a lot of people are itching to have that one-to-one -one or human contact soon. Yeah. So how is, uh, how is everything in North Carolina? Are you guys uh, able to kind of get out and about? Uh, more and more. The, um, the weather's great, which is lovely uh, in North Carolina. Uh, starting, I think, June 1st, most of the restrictions will be lifted. But as far as uh, folks on this call, like industry folks, it's the same story everywhere. You know, we'd be twice as busy if we had twice as many people <laughs> uh, to work. It's, it's, not a, it's not an issue with demand. It's an issue with the hospitality supply. Yeah, and I think that's pretty much across the board. I was in Chicago last week and they had that same issue. Like even places that are iconic. Uh, down here in, uh, in, in Miami, 95 is the major interstate, and they've actually got a number of signs saying, we're hiring. So it's, everybody's looking, that's for sure. Definitely. Well, before we get too involved, we should say hello to everybody, officially. Welcome you all to the, uh, this is our Industry Insider Series, and this is a, one of the events that we keep doing. It's just a cocktails and conversation, and this time we're going to do some cocktails, but we're also going to taste some, some neat drams uh, of scotch. Uh, specifically, we're going to taste through four of these Dalmore from Highland uh, with our illustrious guests here. We've got Ben Boyce and Marlon Sloshevsky. Very good. Yeah? Nailed it. Oh, God. I was pre-gaming earlier. Oh, OK, <laughs> great. His name is Long. Uh, Welcome, welcome, fellas. Really, really appreciate it. Now, you gave me your, your titles off, off, and one is Eastern and Midwest, and one is Northeast. But the important part to Luke and I was single malt whiskey specialist is part of your title. Can you, either one of you want to take this? What does that mean? Uh, I guess I'll start it off with answering all the questions at once, and then Marlon, if you want to follow in as well. So single malt whiskey specialist, it's a fancy title. Uh, for I drink a lot uh, and I get a chance to actually get paid to drink a lot. So it's uh, it's there's definitely some perks I mean, I can see with Curtis and Patty back there. They've got a lovely bar even if it's virtual It looks fantastic and I can tell you I'd probably love sitting at the bar myself uh, But uh, single malt whiskey specialist is a fancy term for somebody who spends a lot of time Really narrowing in on a very specific category within the whiskey world, which is for us scotch uh, primarily the brands that we carry, obviously, we've got Dalmor, Jura, but we've also have a number of other brands across the world, Tom the Bullen, Fett to Karen. We've also got a number of blends. We've got a Shackleton, which is a blended malt whiskey. We've got John Barr, uh, which is a blended whiskey, White Mackay, which is a blended whiskey. Uh, we've got a number of other bourbon-esque style whiskeys that we also have in Scotland as well. Uh, branding is always an interesting thing, especially when you're talking about it's a blend. So how do you call it a bourbon style whiskey that's not a blend? So it's always interesting to see how the marketing works. Uh, but uh, I cover the eastern region. So this is going to be everything from basically uh, um, Pennsylvania all the way down to Florida and all the way over to Tennessee. 
and the Midwest. So I cover everything from Minnesota, uh, Illinois, Indiana, Missouri, and I basically get to go around and preach the gospel of Scotch whiskey. It's a uh, it's a tough job. It's one that I definitely feel like I've I've, I've earned at this point. But uh, Marlin covers the uh, the Northeast region. is the newest member to our team. Uh, super excited. I wanted to have him on because this way you have the entire East Coast representing the Dalmore and Jura tonight. So Marlon, I'll let you, I'll turn it over to you. You've got way more of a fascinating background than I do. <laughs> uh, so, so well put. Um, I uh, do essentially Ben's, Ben's role uh, in, uh, in the Northeast. I spend about 95% of my time um, in Metro New York, uh, which is, uh, you know, the five boroughs, Long Island and Westchester. Um, and, um, and yeah, it's a, it's a hybrid between, uh, marketing whiskey. So the, 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 the really fun part of it, like, uh, being on with, uh, with you guys. Um, and then there's also a little bit of the nitty gritty commercial side of selling whiskey and looking at spreadsheets, but all in all the, uh, marketing side makes the nitty gritty admin and commercial side well worth it for me. Yeah, that's true. I mean, what we do is a little bit more than an ambassador, but, uh, not as much as a uh, complete uh, uh, business development manager, the people that are behind the scenes, commercial. Think of it as like a GM of a restaurant. We get to do the best of both worlds. Excellent. Excellent. So we've gone ahead and poured some of this Dalmore 12. Uh, I'm getting some uh, notes for myself, but before I do, uh, can we talk, when you're talking to folks, when you're describing, the Dalmore 12 to somebody who maybe doesn't even have the bottle in front of them, what would you say? Like what distinguishes Dalmore from other folks in the single malt category? Uh, you know, I'd say with anything, when it comes to whiskey, whiskey's meant to be shared. And of course, whenever you start a scotch tasting, you have to start off with a toast. So if you don't already have a glass in front of you, let's start this properly. So you'll notice that I've got an interesting glass. It's called a Colpita. This is an actual nosing glass for sherry. Uh, You'll also see a couple Glen Cairns or rocks glasses. Either of these are going to be relatively uh, uh, good for whiskey, but we'll go into a little bit later on how to actually properly nose. So in wine, there is wisdom. In beer, there is strength. But in whiskey, there is the water of life. Slanjava. Cheers. So the 12-year-old. Uh, this is what we call Andrew's masterpiece. Now, Andrew McKenzie was the second master distiller that worked at the Dalmore Distillery. Uh, the second in line for the McKenzie's, which the McKenzie's and Dalmore have such a long, long history together uh, that it's, it's definitely uh, quite rich. And we'll go into that in detail as we start tasting some of the other expressions. But the 12 year olds really to kind of break it down is it's a Highland style whiskey. So Highland is tough to kind of define from a particular taste point because geographically it's such a wide range. But what you can get out of the Highland regions is multiple maturation meaning it starts in one barrel and it goes directly to another one. I always say it's kind of like, uh, it's kind of like the matrix. I know it's just bear with me on this one. So when you are in the matrix and you need a quick download and you download a new language, for example, that's basically what whiskey does. When it goes from one cask, it has one language. It downloads a second language when going into that second cask or third cask or fourth cask. Uh, and that's where you're really getting a lot of the kind of uh, the, the sophistication with, uh, with Highland whiskeys. Uh, if you were to compare them to like a wine, these would be the Cabernet Sauvignon. These are big, they're bold, they're juicy. They got a lot of personality, a lot of depth. Highland whiskeys are traditionally devoid of peat, meaning they don't have that big campfire or smoke characteristic that is uh, synonymous for Scotch whiskeys. I mean, I can tell you if I got a dollar for every time somebody said, ooh, I don't like Scotch, I don't like smoke, I'd be very, very wealthy right now, uh, which is good. Yeah, we all would. Yeah, <laughs> Scotch whiskeys. Uh, are, are heavily peated, and that's really about it. So there's a lot of variety that are not. Uh, so Dalmore is unique in a sense of uh, what I like to call kind of a one-to-one -one relationship. Uh, a better term that people might understand is kind of like farm to table. Now that concept is originally designed from a chef working directly with a farmer. So they get the freshest, best quality produce and also meats and whatever directly to the restaurant that'll be cooked that evening so it has the best quality of nutrition. Now, for us, one-to-one -one relationship is very similar. We actually work closely with a different barrel houses that we also uh, partner with. So for example, you know, majority of our, of our casks that we use for the initial maturation, the first fill bourbon casks, they're usually coming from Heaven Hill. Majority of them are coming from Heaven Hill. But for us, 
it isn't the beginning that makes the most important impact, it's the end that makes the biggest Im impact. And this is where we start to really showcase a unique relationship that we have outside of any other major distillery in Scotland. And this is the ability to go directly to bodegas and hand select the finished casks. Uh, to kind of give you some context, unfortunately, not many people drink sherry. But in Scotland, there's a lot of sherry finishes. So where do all those casks come from? Now, there's a huge part of the industry that is primarily about seasoning casks. And in fact, about 70% of sherry that it's actually produced is made just for the Scotch whiskey industry. So they'll take the, the Sobotera, which is the new wine, they'll put it into the cask, they'll let it rest for roughly about a year to two years. They'll dump that sherry out. They'll turn it into brandy, vinegar, or even into, uh, to, uh, uh, or even throw it away. Uh, and then they'll use those casks as the sherry finish or the sherry cask from beginning to end. Now we actually have relationships with the actual sherry producers in a sense where we go directly to their top tier, their uh, Solera, the best casks in the actual collection. And those are the casks that we're using for our final finish. Uh, give you some reference, Gonzalez Fias, who we work with directly, we actually get their, what they call Matusalem Oloroso Sherry. Now this is a VORS certified, meaning it's regulated by the government, 30 year old sherry. So we're getting the casks that this rich, beautiful sherry is actually seasoning in these casks, which could be anywhere from 10 years old to, to 80 year old casks. So a lot of flavor, just bursting with, uh, with personality. And we get to hand select them. Richard Patterson, our master blender, goes down about twice a year to, to the uh, Jaretha de la Fontera and he hand selects each cask. So quality over quantity has always been our DNA. And if you're looking at those, the combination between sherry and bourbon, especially with a distillate that is devoid of peat but has beautiful salinity, a lot of dark chocolate notes, a lot of citrus notes. So when we make this first cocktail, you'll see how this is actually the perfect whiskey for making this cocktail. And for anybody watching, uh, we will be offering all four of these tomorrow as a uh, break even pour. So if you're local and like to stop by, come on down. Marlon, I think you're a little closer than I am, so. <laughs> <laughs> so when I was, Tasting, some of the things you, you mentioned um, about uh, Dalmore that I thought was interesting. Uh, a, the lack of peat, which I know is pretty standard in Highland, but a lot of folks that like scotch, even folks that like scotch, uh, maybe they associate all of their favorite scotches are all Isla scotches. So it's like, okay, it's not supposed to taste like that. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's like saying, you know, as a steak, this is a really good chicken. It's like, it's not the same thing. Um, <laughs> something that I noticed uh, about tasting it again, um, taste it again for the first time. No, the, as opposed to some of the other bigger marks in Highland, which tend to be like really bright, uh, this one's got a lot of dark flavor, a lot of date, almost tobacco. It's mm -hmm. chewy, like, which is really nice in a whiskey. Got a nice biscotti. What was that? Got a nice viscosity. Yeah, which I like in my whiskey. Uh, so I thought that was nice. And maybe as we go through the tasting, we can talk more about that salinity thing. A lot yep. of times when I think about scotch and salinity, I think about coastal whiskey um, that has that like campfire on the beach kind of thing, that iodine. But this, you really get a salinity that for the, I tried the 18 as well constant research uh that re that salinity really comes out in that as, like even more so than this so the downmore distillery is right on the edge of what they call the chromoidy firth now this is the major sea inlet that they have for the northern region of scotland that is the inlet to the north sea it's also probably one of the most famous areas for uh historians to go to as well uh for a number of different reasons but that's kind of where the farming or agriculture uh, step had taken in Scotland in that particular region. So Dalmore is actually named after the actual place itself. It means uh, golden field or almost golden grain. So it's named after the actual area and the people that cultivated it, you know, two, three hundred years, uh, two, three thousand years ago when they started going from hunter gather into cultivation and farming. Uh, with the actual salinity, the Dalmore distillery is right on the edge of that Cromody Firth and right behind it are the mighty Ben Wevis Mountains. So when you have temperature change, that wind will move in and out 
And especially if you live on a coast, that lovely salinity will always be on the air because of all the nice, the mist that comes off of the actual tide itself. So that salt, that salinity, that briny characteristic really kind of coats the entire landscape of, uh, of that region. So when we source grains from that area, it does have a lovely salinic, almost briny characteristic. You know, Scotch whiskeys, people ask me, what is a Scotch whiskey? And I always usually kind of say as a, as a whole, if I were to describe it one way, it's going to be mineral forward. And there's so much flavor in those particular minerals that are coming out of this particular whiskey. And if you let it sit in these really old, rich casks, you're going to get a lot of that uh, without stealing from the wine world too much, but that almost like that barn floor or like that wet wood kind of characteristic that really gives it a personality. Like you can walk into one of their rick houses and see some of the actual blending tanks that they used a hundred years ago. And it's just, it's the most fascinating, just amazing experience when you see these beautiful houses. So when are we going? You guys ready? Well, uh, yeah, you've already kind of popped a hole in the myth that uh, all scotch has pee. So let's pop a hole in the myth that you shouldn't make cocktails at a single malt. You know, if you go to Scotland and you ask for a whiskey, they're going to give you scotch. If you go to France and you ask for a whiskey, they're going to give you scotch. Scotch. <laughs> it's only in the United States that when you say, I'd like a whiskey, they have to offer you a bourbon or even a, a Tennessee style whiskey. So Marlon, you've, you've traveled from, from all parts of the world. What, what is your experience? Well, I spent a lot of time in the, in the Far East, Hong Kong, Singapore, um, Japan. And in my experience, in that part of the world, they give you mostly scotch, but the pores are just too small. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, I mean, uh, outside of the United States, um, I, I, I agree with Ben. It's, um, it, it's, it's mostly scotch, and it's, it's consumed in a variety of ways. And, um, it, and I'm very much in agreement with you. I think uh, a, a scotch cocktail is, is, is wonderful. Yeah, well, if you think about like where cocktails initially kind of had their birth, you know, we had a lot of history in the United States initially before Prohibition, but there were a lot of great barmen that came out of Europe as well. So they didn't have bourbon. They didn't have American whiskey. If they had whiskey, it was scotch. Generally, it was a blended scotch, not too many single malt cocktails back in the day, but uh, it's still something that is, uh, you know, we've got we to give a lot of love and praise to the phylloxera aphid for bringing whiskey to, the, to uh, the forefront of the world. Now for you wine drinkers, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but whiskey drinkers, it was a godsend moment for us. Uh, so you want to go ahead and try the cocktail? Let's do yeah. it. All right. So we're going to make a rift kind of off the old fashioned. And uh, I know that the old fashioned is kind of a, you know, a, of course you're making a whiskey old fashioned. But I really love this whiskey for two reasons. One, because it really points out some of the significant flavors from Dalmore, which is dark chocolate and citrus. A lot of bitter and sweet like competition that's constantly going on. Uh, and then, of course, when you're looking at uh, 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 the old fashioned, it is the number two cocktail that's called in the world, right behind the margarita, which, of course, the margarita, of course, is, is huge. Uh, but it's, uh, it's a recognizable uh, cocktail. It's an easy cocktail to make. And if you make a few minor adjustments to kind of tweak it to your own palate, it can be extremely sweet or it can be extremely savory. It can be any of those in between. So... The simple cocktail recipe that I actually use is going to be a little bit of, uh, instead of, it's going to be more of an uh, um, uh, 18, 18, was it 1838 Circa original old fashioned, which is going to be bitters forward. It's not going to be uh, fruit forward. So you're not going to see any muddling in this particular whiskey, but you're going to actually take a combination of bitters that are a little untraditional. So instead of just Angostura, you're also going to be adding some orange bitters and some chocolate bitters in there as well to really bring up the the, uh, the acidity as well as also to translate well over to the sweetness of the agave that we're going to use. So if you've already got a cocktail in front of you or a vessel in front of you, you're going to have to bear with me. My bar is not the best right now, but obviously a mixing vessel is going to be an easy way to go. You want to start off with uh, your least expensive ingredient first. So in my case, it's going to be the agave and it's also going to be the bitters. So with the agave, I traditionally like to go small batch as much as I can, just because I love to support the, uh, the smaller purveyors or producers. Organic is also quite a good way to go as well. So we're going to do about a half ounce pour. If you like your cocktails a little bit drier, then I'd go a little bit less, maybe a quarter of an ounce instead. 
Uh, we'll actually add that into the actual vessel. So the bitters, if you have it, like for example, I've got bittermans in front of me, which always makes good, easy access. You can find them pretty much anywhere. So we're gonna do one chocolate, we're gonna do one citrus, and we're gonna do one aromatic. So Angostura bitters is the best aromatic that you can probably find pretty much anywhere. Uh, once you actually have those ingredients in the actual glass, and you have to bear with me, I'm not nearly as, uh, as skilled as I used to be behind the bar, so I'm doing my best. You know, obviously, you want to pour the actual whiskey as well. So in this case, a little Dalmore 12. Oop. All right, add some ice. Of course, I'm gonna give it the actual actual stir. I usually go about, I don't know, about 10 seconds to about 15 seconds. What we're doing here is we're actually activating the, uh, 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 um, the water molecules. So we're actually chilling it quite a bit. And we're also diluting it enough where we get a chance to kind of mix those flavors together. Because the agave especially is a little on the um, thick side. So if you don't have it cut like a lot of bars do, then it's gonna stick like honey does. So if you've got a beautiful rocks glass, go ahead and fill it up with ice. And then you take your julep strainer and just pour right over the ice. Now this is where it gets fun. You can actually do a, uh, a combination of things. Like I personally love to combine both a little bit of sweet and savory. So I kind of pre wrapped this particular piece, but I've got my, uh, my um, uh, filthy cherry, uh, as well as my orange peel around the outside. Uh, if you wanna go traditionally fresh, which I'm looking for my peeler, which is here somewhere. Uh, here we go. You can just take the actual orange, pull off the actual zest, get a nice long one, take it right over the actual glass, and just zest over the actual top. You can put it into the actual cocktail. If you want to get fun and funky, which uh, you're at home, might as well, especially since you're not driving. If you have a kitchen grade torch, you can also caramelize the outside of the actual orange. So you're almost going to get more of a, um, like a citrus, uh, almost like, um, that's the best way to describe it. You can kind of see it kind of erupt on the outside as well. If you smell it, it almost smells like, um, like orange popcorn, like candied, candied orange. It's really kind of fun. And then you can actually peel that off and put it in your glass as well. So this is the Dalmore Old Fashioned, or what we like to call the, uh, the, uh, the Royal Stag. Uh, wonderful, wonderful cocktail, easy to make. Even I can make it, and I haven't been behind the bar in over 10 years. So I hope you enjoy this one. Slangeva. Cheers. I personally go a little bit less on the agave, but that's more because I like that more the, the 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 brightness of the actual whiskey itself. How'd I do, guys? Did I do okay? Drink this all day. It's an easy one. So especially yeah. with that lovely, uh, uh, um, you know, you're gonna get the obviously you're gonna get the bitter from the bitters. You're gonna get a lot of the citrus from uh, from the whiskey as well as from the orange bitters. A lot of dark chocolate from the whiskey and the orange bitters. The agave is almost like this molasses-y kind of characteristic, which is uh, great, especially when you pull in off of like dried fruit notes like you get from the actual Dalmore 12. These two are just a perfect combination. So I hope you enjoy. Thank, Thank you very much. Thanks. Marlon, anything to add? Um, no, unfortunately, I did not come as prepared as the rest of you to this call. Um, but in my experience, um, I always love to start my events with uh, the, the Dalmore Old Fashioned. Um, and exactly like Ben pointed out, the, um, the chocolate and the orange bitters really make all the difference, which is really the, the DNA of, of the Dalmore 12. And it just accentuates it a little bit more. And then, you know, if you do have a good quality syrup to hand, um, that that makes that makes all the difference. So whether it's uh, the the syrup from um, that we see here behind Ben, um, that that's that's obviously going to be really really nice. And then also you know I if if you are making syrups at home if you don't have access to these, um, I always like to use um, some some demerara sugar to to make my simple syrup. But 
I am looking forward to uh, playing around with, with these syrups as well. Um, and uh, really uh, stepping my game up for, for, for my uh, cocktail events. You know, not to go off on a tangent about these syrups, but uh, my favorite cocktail to make at home, and I don't even really know if you can call it a cocktail, it's just a whiskey highball. So a little Topo Chico, a little Scotch whiskey. You can put a little lemon in it too, as well as a little bit of lemon zest over the top. But if you want to spice it up, you can always use one of these beautiful syrups, which we've got in front of us. Like I've got blueberry right here. You can kind of throw a little blueberry. Blueberry and, and lemon go beautifully together. So obviously makes a wonderful, wonderful cocktail on the, on the patio for sure. Well, thanks for that. I'm going to make one right now, actually. So, <laughs> Especially in warmer weather, like where Ben is in, in Miami, the, the highballs are just fantastic. You know, I, I, I first uh, got to know the highball in my time uh, spent in Asia prior to, prior to moving here to New York. And um, it, it's, a, it's a really commonly consumed cocktail over there. Uh, it's kind of your beer replacement in, in Japan. Uh, it's, it's a little bit less calorific. And it's just, uh, you know, if you are so inclined to enjoy a drink with lunch. Um, it, it's the, it's, it's one of the perfect options in my opinion. Nice. I agree. <laughs> ben, <laughs> earlier you mentioned you were drinking from a uh, copita, a, a sherry glass. Uh, and then you also mentioned Glen Karen. Now is Glen Karen, that's originally a Scotch drinking glass, is it not? That is true. And Glen Karen, the company is uh, also based out of, uh, out of the UK. Uh, it's uh, or maybe it's not the UK. Maybe it's uh, actually I can't remember where it's from originally. I but think they are from the UK. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> and it's a it's a glass, and you've seen it already, kind of floating around. It looks like this. It's got a nice big heavy bottom, easy to enjoy, easy to hold on to. Keeps you from doing this because we don't drink whiskey this way. We drink it this way. Uh, it also has a narrow, excuse me, a wide base and a narrow nose. So when you're nosing. You can get your nose right in there without any other major influences to kind of really stop the, uh, the exploration of the actual uh, aromas that are coming from the whiskey. Plus, if you've got something a little bit of a higher mm -hmm. alcohol, the aromas are going to rise faster than the alcohol will. So if you put the actual whiskey in the glass, you're going to get the actual floral notes before you get the actual alcohol notes. Now, that's if you don't go what I, what I normally do, mm -hmm. is when I pour my whiskeys, the first thing I do is I do this. <laughs> it's just habit. I mean, too many years of working in the industry, especially in the wine world, first thing you do is you want to swirl and kind of open up the actual wine. Now, whiskey, I, I uh, have gone back and forth a number, number of times on whether or not this is the best way to do it or not, because there's a, there's a very dividing line in the whiskey world. Some say that it destroys the whiskey. Some people say you need to open up a little bit. I have found that if you give it a soft swirl, it's going to just kind of coat the glass. Don't go crazy, because if you go crazy, you're going to do, the, you're going to do this. And all you're going to get is alcohol and you're probably going to pass out because it's a lot of alcohol hitting you in the face. <clears throat> so if you do go like this and you're like, damn it, I shouldn't have done that. A little blow on the top of the glass to kind of help move some of the actual alcohol out. So this is a Copita glass. This is the official nosing glass uh, in most whiskey houses across the world, not just in, uh, in Scotland. And if it doesn't look like a whiskey glass, it's because it's not a whiskey glass. This is the sherry glass. It was originally designed by the sherry producers and then it was adopted by whiskey, uh, whiskey producers because it just has the perfect shape and also nose. Plus it has a lot more, uh, um, if you look at the actual comparison between the two glasses, it's not nearly as wide as the, as the Glen Karen. This particular glass is uh, perfect for enjoying the Dalmore because of the soft aromatics and just a low alcohol that we have. So if you haven't had a proper nosing, and I don't know if you guys want to go into this already, sure. and I can walk yeah. you through it. So you'll notice that we've got multiple different kinds of glasses tonight. We've got rocks glasses. We've got copitas like you've seen uh, Marlon and myself actually using. And then we also have the traditional Glen Karen. Now, there's always going to be one that's going to be better for the other, but it, a lot of it also comes down to the actual user. Uh, and, and ultimately, there's only two ways to enjoy Scotch whiskey. That's your left hand and your right hand. <laughs> so how you drink it is up to you. You want to try it in a beautiful copita glass, if you want to try it on the rocks, if you want to put it into a cocktail, as long as you enjoy it, that's really the biggest part. But if you really want to get into it and you really want to break it down, the right glassware is always important to have. Uh, especially if you, uh, like for example, if you like wine, you're not going to put a Bordeaux in a burgundy glass because it's just not the right glass. It's the same thing with whiskey. We want to put it into a copita or a Glencairn, not a rocks glass. 
So this way we can actually, uh, you know, really control the flavors and how they rise. So if you give it a little bit of swirl, it's gonna coat the inside of the glass. And this is gonna be a good way to kind of, uh, you know, the first introduction. Because when you meet somebody for the first time, you don't go running in and giving everybody a big bear hug. I mean, you might, but you're gonna get some strange looks. You wanna go in and you wanna do it softly. You wanna do it with respect. So whiskey's no different. So just like a wine tasting, after you give it a little bit of a swirl, you wanna nose it. But remember, this is 40% alcohol, not 14% alcohol. So if you go in aggressively, you're just gonna fry out your tasting vessel, which is gonna be your nose. This is the important part of actually enjoying a whiskey for the first time. <clears throat> so now that we've learned what we're not supposed to do, let's learn what we're supposed mm -hmm. to do. So when we take the actual glass and you put it up to your nose and you'll notice that I put my nose right in there. I don't waste any space. I'm not breathing in, but I'm at least letting it kind of sit and mellow in the actual glass. From here, I'll take a breath in through my mouth, not my nose. This way, you'll still get a little bit of air travel through your nasal cavity, which gives you the subtle characteristics. Now, if you went like this, <coughs> that means you're going a little too heavy. You're going a little too aggressive. You're going to get slapped. It's going to really fry your, your nasal cavity. It's also going to really uh, um, screw with your, uh, with your nose as well. You might actually inhale whiskey up your nose, and that's the last thing that you want to do. So now that we've had a chance to kind of like nose it, we nose it once. And you'll notice that uh, Marlon was doing this a little bit earlier. He was going from right to left. Now you don't have to do it this dramatically, but really you're gonna get different flavors out of each side of your nose. So going from left to right, I personally get more savory into sweet. Now this is because I've done a lot of nosings and I've really kind of gotten to know my nose really, really well. But with, with, uh, with enjoying a whiskey for the first time, doing it softly, especially if you're gonna do like a high proof bourbon, or a high proof barrel select that you get from Scotland. A lot of alcohol is gonna be really aggressive. So going in, breathing in through your mouth is gonna give you a subtle approach. Now, after you know a number of whiskeys, you'll know kind of how to actually go about it. And you don't necessarily have to do the gaping mouth every single time you walk into a bar. Because if you do that every time you walk into a bar, people are gonna be like, what is wrong with that guy? <laughs> so Take your time, subtlety, it's a really big part of it. But then of course the tasting is always important. So the first tasting is about to wake up your palate. It's really kind of introduce yourself for the first time. The second tasting is where you become friends. So in Scotland, you heard me say this a little bit earlier, we say slan java. It's Gaelic for good health and prosperity. It's like cheers or prost or, or uh, uh, um, uh, kung pai. It's any of those particular expressions about giving good fortune to the people that you're with and, and, and uh, in the room as well as yourself. So a good indication of how long we actually want to hold it on the palate is already on the bottle. This says 12 years old. So we want to do 12 seconds. So just like enjoying wine, let it sit on the top of your palate, let it go underneath the palate, go, go from cheek to cheek, over the top again, but you want to do it for 12 seconds. Are you guys ready for this? I'll admit I went to the 15 because I already drank all the 12. I've got the 12. You have a tendency to talk a little too much. So yeah. let's, let's raise this glass. We'll do 12 seconds on the palate, and then I'll walk you through the finish part of the actual tasting. So on three, one, two, three, Salon Java. Salon Java. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now let it go down. Now count backwards from 10. 10, 9, 8, <laughs> 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. What this is doing is it's really kind of setting in the actual flavors. So you'll notice, at least for myself, I get a lot of citrus, a lot of dark chocolate on the note. A little bit sweeter aromatics, but on the palate, sweet initially, but then it gets bone dry as soon as I swallow. And you start getting a lot more of those like cinnamon, nutmeg spices. You'll get a little bit of almost like dark cacao right at the very end of the actual finish. You'll notice that you're also salivating a little bit more. So that's gonna be from the actual tannins from the cask, which get your palate nice and ready for that second taste, which is always the most important. Slange of How was that for the first time? That was, that was excellent. That uh, orange, is so well articulated. It's there for sure. 
And it's such a beautiful, beautiful flavor. Now, a lot of people, when they talk about sherry casks, they usually think a little bit sweeter. Mm. Uh, but if it's a true Oloroso or if it's a true Fino type casks, those are a dry white wine. They're extremely uh, uh, mineral forward and you're going to get a lot of more, you're going to get a lot more dried fruit. You're going to get a lot more nuts. You're going to get a lot more of just like almost like olives kind of notes. Uh, very mineral, mineral forward. So if you take those flavors, it doesn't sound sweet. So, but if you combine it with ex-bourbon casks, which give you a lot of vanilla, caramel, baking spice, even a little bit of almost like uh, fruit notes, like banana notes or mango notes, it gives that beautiful balance between sweet and savory. So a lot of the sweetness isn't necessarily coming from the sherry, it's coming from the bourbon or the American white oak. Hmm. Yeah, the, and we've recently had some, some bourbon folks on this, and the, I guess in, for American whiskey, specifically with bourbon, they're talking around 75% of what they're saying, the flavor profile is the barrel. Yeah. Yeah. Now, they're using first time charred oak barrels. They can be uh, intense. There's a reason why most bourbons are no more than about two to four years old, because they've got a lot of personality to give. Okay, what do you say we move on to the 15 year before we, otherwise this guy's gonna be done with the 15 before we start it. <laughs> yeah, you know, well, it's research. Uh, uh, ben, do you, now do you, when you tasting things, do you switch up glassware depending on how old or different products? It, it really depends. If I go from uh, one distillery, I usually kind of keep the same glass, but if I change regions, I especially will change a glass. So if I go to like Space Side or if I go to Isla or even like Campleton, I'll usually change up or even distilleries. If I go from like Dalmore into like Glen Morangie, which is literally about 250 yards apart from each other, I'll change glassware just because they're the way that they approach their whiskey is a little bit different. Uh, when it comes to uh, tasting and tasting notes, I've got four different whiskeys just because it's easy for me to grab. But normally if I'm tasting through a line, I'll actually keep the same glass because uh, it's nice and seasoned at that point. It's opened up a little bit more, but that's my own personal approach. Marlon, how about yourself? Uh, no, I agree with that. I think the more whiskey you drink out of a glass, the cleaner it gets. <laughs> but, um, but no, you know, one of the reasons I enjoy having multiple glasses is to, you know, taste and then go back to, 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 to the previous whiskey. Uh, so if you guys are, do have access to multiple glasses, uh, I would encourage you to try the 15 and then go back to the, pour yourself a little bit more of the 12 if you have, or if you, there's still some in the glass, go back and kind of see that comparison. And um, that's really always a really eye-opening experience for me. And it, it, it lets me learn a lot. So um, yeah, and, and the science, it brings Sorry, up ahead, the point that Marlon actually pointed out, going back to the actual glass, you know, especially when you're looking at aged whiskeys, especially older aged whiskeys, so like you get above a 12, 15 into 18. It's just like a good Bordeaux. Once you pour it, it's going to be different and then 15 minutes. So letting it open up a little bit is also a really great way to also enjoy your whiskeys. A hundred percent agreed. And on, on that note, you know, especially in Scotland, um, our, our colleagues across the pond, they always love to add a little bit of water into their whiskey. Um, so don't, don't be shy about that. I, you know, I typically like to do, you know, one or two drops. Um, in Scotland, the master distillers, um, you know, sometimes they'll, they'll do quite a significant amount, right? So sort of, you know, 50-50 is not something that's unheard of. Um, Again, for me, one or two drops does the trick, especially with the Dalmore already being such a drinkable whiskey. But what you'll see is a lot of those fatty acids that are in the whiskey sort of expand and you'll get this like little weighty, oily texture on top of your whiskey. And it's uh, one, it's a beautiful sight. And two, um, you'll get a little bit something different. However, this also happens on the palate naturally through, uh, you know, the saliva we have in our mouths uh, that, that opens up the whiskey. But this way, adding water into the whiskey uh, expedites the process a little bit um, and you get a little bit out of it. So another, another thing that I would recommend doing when tasting whiskey is uh, tasting the whiskey neat without anything added and then adding just one droplet of water and see if you guys can tell the difference. So moving on to this 15. Yeah. Um, it, it seems to be a little lighter. And Absolutely. I'm getting more bread. Is that, uh, tell me about that. 
absolutely. So to me, the the fifteen is is probably one of my my favorite whiskeys in the range. Uh, it's an incredibly elegant whiskey. Um, the best way to describe it, in my opinion, is it's a really wonderful afternoon whiskey. Uh, it's it's a, it's a great dram after after a big lunch. Um, it's nice. It's light. It's fragrant. It's delicious. Uh, ben, Marlon, do you want to go into the Mar Marlon? So where did I go wrong? <laughs> I need an afternoon whiskey for the sole this purpose is, of drinking after a large afternoon lunch. I, I what am I doing with my life? I took that to heart. <laughs> I think Marlon spends, Marlon spends a lot of time in Spain, I think is what it is. <laughs> Sounds like it. <laughs> well, Last you know, few times I've had great afternoon whiskeys after big afternoon lunches, we're all in Spain. God, I get it. <laughs> oh, here's my uh, I, very, uh, um, um, whiskey highball. <laughs> oh. oh, cheers. I do, I do live a bit of a, a, a madman style life in, in that regard. Um, but no, however, I think, you know, it's a wonderful whiskey to enjoy in the afternoon. Um, and yeah, Ben, do you want to go into the maturation story or uh, should yeah. I? So you know, the 15 is what we consider, even though, uh, um, you know, I, one thing I forgot to mention about the 12 year old is when it was actually produced originally. So it was originally released in 1880, which doesn't seem that long ago. Uh, but some fun, interesting facts about uh, single malts. Single malts were traditionally used for blending purposes. So they were sold to your Shivas, your, your Johnny Walker, your famous grouse, uh, is that backbone to the actual whiskeys themselves. Because corn is going to give you sweets. Uh, same thing with, uh, with, uh, with wheat. <clears throat> uh, and then you get rye, which is going to give you spice. But barley is going to give you body. It's going to really give you that hep, that, that, uh, that lingering full taste. Uh, so single malts are considered, you know, kind of the apex within the actual category when it comes to whiskeys, but it only makes up about 10% of total production in Scotland. So back in the day, it was less than like 0.1%. So selling single malts was something that was almost unheard of. It was something that either you knew somebody that knew somebody, or it was that you visited the distillery and actually pulled from their actual casks themselves. So when we're talking about a whiskey that's been produced in 1880, it was revolutionary. It was huge. It's kind of like Remy Martin when he produced the first two-year-old cognac back in 1736. People's minds were blown. They're just like, nobody's going to buy it. It's too expensive. It's wasteful. Too many taxes that are being paid on this particular liquid. But lo and behold, it's the entry into cognac today. Same thing with our 12-year-old Dalmore. When we first entered this into the market, we were the very first 12-year-old to be sold in the open market in Scotland. Uh, and that's pretty amazing if you think about history and you think about Scotch history. So innovation, creativity, and always being like forthcoming and also uh, proactive on ingredients and production as well as into, uh, into the people that actually make the whiskey has always been a big part of our DNA. So the 12 being introduced in 1880 was the first 12 year old to be sold in the open market. So as of today, this is gonna be one that we considered uh, Andrew, our master blender during that time period, Andrew's masterpiece. So the 15, is what we consider our house style. Now, if you're gonna give a particular house style to any whiskey, 15 kind of fits the bar for Dalmore pretty well because it really showcases that history going all the way back to 1536 when we've got the first introduction of Sherry and Oscar Usca Brea, which is the water of life, which is what you see off of the actual stills, uh, uh, is uh, <clears throat> uh, um, really showing the history between Sherry casks and also our native drink. Just like I had said that whiskey is the water of life. This is what I mean by that. So Uska Brea, it's Gaelic and it basically means water of life and it goes into Uska, Iska and eventually into whiskey, which is what we see today. So it's kind of evolved over time. So the 15 really showcases that love of sherry and those sherry bomb type scotch whiskeys and also our original distillate. So it starts off in ex bourbon casks for roughly 12 years. What this does is it really sets in that DNA, vanilla, caramel, baking spice, even a little bit of, of, uh, of uh, fruit notes. And then we transfer it into three distinctly different casks that are sherry casks. Now, all of these are 30 plus year old casks that we get from the Gonzales Bias winery in Jaretha de la Fontera down in Southern Spain. Now, these are again, those casks that I told you about before, where Richard Patterson, our master blender, will go and he'll hand pick each of these particular casks for the final finish. So we have one sherry that is, uh, is uh, which Matusla Molorosa, which you have exclusive rights to use outside of any other producer. That's what the 12 year old is finished in. We also have Amoroso sherry, and we also have a Pastelige sherry. 
Now, without getting into a Sherry lesson, which, you know, if you guys want to do Sherry one day, you let us know. We'll do Sherry as well. Yeah. John. Uh, we can, uh, we can uh, without going down that rabbit hole, <clears throat> one of them is very sweet, one of them is very dry, one's right smack dab in the middle. So it gives you a perfect balance of what Sherry is around the world. So bourbon casks, Sherry casks, that love of Highland multiple maturation. So this is by far the most favorite out of all of our whiskeys. When I do staff trainings, when I do education pieces, this is the whiskey I put in front of people if they are like, I'm not really into scotch. This is the whiskey that I give them because it'll make a true believer out of you after you enjoy this one. I also have to put one caveat. This one does have a bit of uh, uh, um, a soft spot for me, especially because when I first started with the company about five years ago, I knew the 12 really well and I knew the 18 pretty well, but I didn't know 15. So I started sipping, typing, 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 sipping, typing, typing, typing. And before I knew it, I was halfway down the bottle. So this is a very easy drinker. As Marlon said, this is your afternoon post-lunch drink, but I guarantee you're going to have at least two or three drams when you have this particular whiskey. Luke, you're not allowed yeah, to take I can, this. To, I mean, I thought about pouring more. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. So <laughs> specifically tasting notes on this, I'm getting that golden raisin from the sherry. Where am I getting the yeast? Where am I getting that bread note? So the way I really describe this one is almost like, um, I'm going to use American terms on this one. It's almost like Christmas. So around Christmas, you have, you know, especially if you're up north, you're going to get a little bit cooler weather. You're going to get a little bit more of that crispness on the air. If you live in a place that has pine trees, you'll get that pine, uh, uh, almost like spice in the backgrounds. This whiskey reminds me of that baked bread and orange marmalade dressing over the top of the actual toast. And then you eat it and then you enjoy it. Another really good way to kind of uh, to, to really showcase the flavors on this one. Do you remember when you were a kid and you'd go through the candy store and you'd find those chocolate oranges? And you'd pull a tinfoil off and you'd smack them in your hand and they'd fall apart in all the pieces. That yep. citrus and dark chocolate, a little bit of spice on the background. That's where this particular whiskey really sits for me. So I really enjoy this one, especially if I'm raising a toast uh, in, in, uh, in a holiday, especially if you're in a, war a cooler climate. This whiskey is just sit back, relax, dinner time as well as at lunchtime. Maybe breakfast for Marlon. I mean, you never know. <laughs> but a lot of spice. A lot of almost like fresh ginger notes. You're going to get a more of the actual like distillate taste themselves. You're going to get more of the grain. That's where you're getting the bread notes from. Uh, so a little bit of that bright apple as well as almost like biscuity kind of characteristic. And then of course the Oloroso is going to give you, and the Apostoles and also the Amoroso, uh, Amoroso Sherry are going to give you more of that dried, uh, dried fruit notes. And you're going to get a lot more almost like walnut notes on this particular one. This one does have, it's light on the palate, but it's meaty on the nose. So we're getting a lot of, a lot of Christmas notes from the guy from South Florida. Yeah. Just uh, making sure we're following along here. Yeah, hey, I know um, live in South Florida. <laughs> so, then? Yeah, I get, uh, I get a lot of, uh, if, for any Italians in the crowd, uh, I hope I'm not going to butcher the name here. Uh, panettone cake, uh, that, that baked panettone cake bread. Um, anyone's familiar with that? I, I just recently uh, picked up a loaf from uh, my friend's bakery and um, that, that's that to me. It's, you know, that uh, a lot of that raisin um, Candy sweetness. In, in Scotland, they call it, uh, they call it uh, pound cake. Uh, in the United States, we call it fruit cake. Now, U.S.'s version, fruit cake, we don't want to get, it's like, it's that hard as a rock. You, you yeah. gift it to somebody you don't like. Pound cake in Scotland is actually really, really good. So if you get pound cake in Scotland, please do it. Enjoy it with a, with a dram of Dalmore 15 and your life will change. Outstanding. Now, when you're hand picking the sherry cat, what exactly are you looking for? So that's a, that's a secret that Richard hasn't really divulged too much in, but a lot of it comes down to certain flavor characteristics. So when he goes to Gonzales Bias, he actually will set up and will walk through the bodega and through the warehouses with the master winemaker. His name is Antonio Flores. So like Richard, he's a third generation um, master. And there really is a, a degree of, of mastery that these two are at that only they can really have that identifying kind of conversation. Uh, Gonzalez Bias has been around a very, very long time. <clears throat> and Antonio Flores' family has, has been a big part of that history. Uh, he was literally born into the business. Like his mother had him in one of the barrel houses 
in Spain. <laughs> right. So he had no choice. He was born in. He wasn't. I'm glad they say he was. <laughs> yeah. So, and Richard, very similar story as well. When he uh, when he started in the whiskey, he's got a twin brother. And uh, they used to run around the warehouse that his father was at because his father was a master blender and a broker and his grandfather was a master blender and a broker as well. Um, and the reason why, and you'll notice that I say broker quite a bit, in Scotland, barrels are still traded openly, freely across multiple different distilleries, which is one of the last kind of barter systems that I know of on an industrial level, which is kind of cool. So Richard's father would take him to the warehouses with him and his brother when they were like you know seven six and seven years old and they thought it was good fun to go running around in the warehouses and just being you know being kids and for him he really picked up the love of the uh, of the warehouses and the the beautiful aromatics of the of the the raw spirit that just lingers in the air if you walk through an actual warehouse yeah i bet a kid running around a rick house is probably drunk by the time he leaves <laughs> So Richard always says he started his, his, uh, his, uh, his, his whiskey making career at the ripe old age of eight years old. Uh, but when he selects casks, he's looking for personality because you can make 10 casks out of the same kind of wood, the exact same time, same toast, the same, uh, the, um, uh, um, the same toast, the same fire. And, and uh, <clears throat> each one of those barrels are going to have a different personality over time. So looking for specific characteristics that Richard, only Richard seems to know is an important part. So he literally will go through with Gonzalez Villas, uh, excuse me, with Antonio Flores, and they will discuss the flavors that come out of it because both of these guys have been in the industry 50 plus years. So they know their warehouses pretty well. Yeah. So they'll get to go in and look at the personalities and how these whiskeys are developing over time and or how these sherries are developing over time and some of the flavors that come out of it. In fact, when we start getting into some of our higher expressions, like for example, our Downmore 25, there's uh, three select barrels that Richard had pulled uh, exclusively from Gonzalez Pius that he had to really kind of pull them away from Antonio Flores. He didn't want to part with them. And they're actually sweet Palomino Fino casks that are 30 plus Ooh. years old. Uh, you don't see sweet Palomino Fino. It just doesn't exist. So, I mean, it's, it's finding that unique, almost like diamond in a rough that Richard is always looking for. But he goes twice a year and he selects all the casks for the, uh, for, the, for the next year to kind of be brought over. They go through and they hand select each one from the different types of uh, uh, flavors that come off of the actual sherry. Or if he goes to W&J Graham's, the port. If he goes to Chateau Latour, the, the uh, Bordeaux. If he goes to Chateau Marbuzzi, the Bordeaux as well. It's, uh, it's pretty unique and kind of a fun job that he has. I think my job's cool until I see what he does. Then I'm like, wow. <laughs> That's what it sounds like. Well, speaking of cool things, so let's say you've sold somebody on the, on the 12 year, Andrew's masterpiece, hint, hint, that's probably a trivia question. Uh, and then they're really excited about the house style, you know, the 15. How do you tell them, I know you like this 15, but you should spend, I don't know how many more dollars on the 18. What's the pitch? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. And I'm going to say the best way that I can think of. The producers themselves, the whiskey makers that work at Downmore, even though the 15 is our house style, if they get to choose, including Richard Patterson, one whiskey to walk away with, it is always the 18. It really culminates that beautiful balance between bourbon casks and those 30-year-old Oloroso sherry casks and the environment around the actual distillery. You're getting a lot of that natural salinity. You're going to get a little bit of almost like that dry funk that you get in a, uh, in a, in a, in a warehouse, uh, as well as just 18 plus years of expansion and development. This is probably uh, one of my absolute favorite whiskeys. Now, for those of you that have kids or that you've got siblings, you know, your parents or you will say, I love you all equally, but really there's that one that uh, never disappoints. Well, <laughs> I get the question all the time, you know, what's your favorite Dalmor or what's your favorite Jura? And I'll, uh, you know, it's, I'll give you the politically correct answer. You know, it depends on where you're at, what environment that you're in. If you want to try it neat, you want to try it uh, on the rocks, if you want to put it in a cocktail, if you're out with friends, if you're out with new people, and those are relevant answers, but really, the 18 is my favorite child. It never disappoints. It is 
always on point. It is absolutely the most beautifully balanced whiskey within our portfolio. It's, uh, it's the go-to for the distillery makers as well as for Richard Patterson when he talks about his whiskey. Even though he's got some of the most unique whiskeys in the world, in fact, last I checked, he's actually made over 2,200 different styles of scotch, uh, different expressions of scotch whiskey, which is pretty impressive. Uh, he still says one of his proudest is definitely the 18. So two questions in 46 months. No. Uh, the, the first, the 12, it's big, it's round, it's muscular, it's chewy. We talked about the like dark, dry fruit dates and such. And then the 15 really exhibits a lot more of that toast, the bread, not even toast, just like bread on the nose. This one, it seems like you've replaced the bread with butterscotch. Is there, what is the, what is the aging? Is it, is it barrel selection? Like, how are you achieving that? It's a combination of barrel selection as well as time. Uh, you know, in Scotland, especially if it says 12, if it says 15, if it says 18, that's an indication of the youngest liquid that's actually in that bottle. It can't be younger legally. It can be older, but it can't be younger. So when we start getting into the higher expressions of, of Dalmor, not just Dalmor, but any of the Scotch whiskeys, there's usually older juice that's in there as well. So for the 18, for example, we usually do about 14 years in ex-bourbon casks, really setting in that vanilla, that caramel baking spice. And if you've had an older bourbon, like one that's gonna be anywhere between four and six years old, you're gonna get a lot more of that natural tannic characteristic that really hits the back of the palate. You're gonna get a lot more butterscotch. Instead of caramel, you're getting more of that, almost like that roasted characteristic. So more time in bourbon is gonna pull some of those sweeter aromatics out that are much more, they're a lot richer than uh, if you had it in there for a short period of time. Because with a barrel and liquid, if you have whiskey in a barrel for about a year, only about 5% of that liquid is actually going into the actual cask itself and then coming back out. It's not much. You're not really getting that full expression. The longer you let it sit in the actual cask, the more that the actual liquid is really penetrating that cask and getting those beautiful flavors and pulling them forward. So if you do 14 versus nine, like you're doing with the 12 to the 18, you're gonna see a huge difference in the overall initial backbone of the actual whiskey. And then when you transfer them into those Oloroso casks, instead of uh, two to three years, like we do with the uh, 12, uh, upwards of six years for the 18, you're really gonna pull those two beautiful flavors together to just really kind of bring home that house style of vanilla and dark chocolate, excuse me, uh, uh, orange and also dark chocolate. I hope that answered it for you. Of course, I get drink one. So Marlon had brought this up a little bit earlier about uh, try it neat, add a few drops of water, then you can go crazy after that. The 18, I think is the perfect way to really add just a touch of water. Try it neat and then add one or two drops in the actual glass. That's really all it takes. And in my case, I've got a little bit of water on the side right here. We're just gonna drop in a few drops and it's literally two drops. It's all you need, even for a full two ounce pour. It's gonna take those natural linic, excuse me, uh, uh, natural uh, um, uh, uh, flavors from the actual cask and bring them right to the surface. Uh, think of it as like when it rains for the first time in a long time, you're gonna smell everything. You're gonna smell the grass, the trees, the flowers, you're gonna smell the pavement, you're gonna smell it all. Now whiskey is the exact same way. So adding water to whiskey is very similar in the sense of like adding a decanter in with red wine. It's gonna give it a different perspective or a different personality. But from a molecular standpoint, we're actually taking these esters or those phenol notes and bringing them to the surface. It's almost like we're just speeding up the process. So you're gonna get a lot more aromatic notes if adding a drop or two of water. In contrary, when you add ice, it takes those natural flavors and it just sucks them back down. So you're not gonna get as much of those bright notes, but you'll get more of those subtle background notes like vanilla, like caramel. You're gonna get a lot more almost like uh, uh, of the biscuity characteristics like you got on the 15 year old. So really enjoying your whiskey is about learning the rules and then breaking all of them. So the next time, I appreciate the advice, but I think I'll stick with it neat next time. <laughs> I think I'd like it better. <laughs> no, I actually do, uh, when, I, when I do master classes in person, I'll actually do a whole seminar on water or not. <clears throat> and uh, mm -hmm. I actually, out of our core line, which is seven different whiskeys, there's three of them that I think adding water ruins. I won't tell you which ones. 
because that's my personal opinion. Now, it's fun because I'll actually set up a 12 and a 15 and then I'll add water to, like mm -hmm. after everybody tries it, everybody adds a drop of water to each mm -hmm. one and tries it again. And I say, which one's better? And it's almost like this fight just erupts. People get really passionate about it. They're just like, absolutely not, no water. And they're like, no, water helps, water helps. And sometimes I have to like jump in between and I'm like, all right guys, <laughs> it's really about what you enjoy more than yeah. anything else. But water is gonna help change its perspective. Just like a decanter doesn't always help a red wine. It definitely gives it a different expression, but it's there to kind of like let you really make your own opinion. So try it neat, add a few drops of water, then you can go crazy. If you don't like it with a little bit of water, next time, don't add water. Yeah. Oh, no, I, I definitely still like it, uh, just not as much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that's actually a really uh, fantastic analogy that, that Ben pointed out. It, it, water is both synonymous to, to a decanter, right? Um, you wouldn't put a bottle of, of Burgundy Pinot Noir into the decanter, most likely. Um, where, however, if you have a Bordeaux or a California Cab, a uh, decanter is going to be super beneficial. You know, if you've got um, um, an 18-year-old and he just so happened to have some dark chocolate laying around. Handy. Just, just, just saying, if you got it handy, I definitely recommend trying the two next to each other. It's life-changing. I always say a good date night starts off with champagne and strawberries, but always ends with a Highland whiskey and dark chocolate. <laughs> okay, even That's for breakfast. I love it. Or lunch, dinner. Or lunch, whatever. Lunch. Yeah, don't discriminate, however it works. So 18 is a number that uh, famously is important uh, in the Japanese market. Is when y'all first came onto the Japanese market, did you like many distilleries lead with your 18 year? You know, I, I think that's an interesting question. And I actually had to answer, I asked a few people around about this one. There was no real reason why uh, 12 or 15 or 18 is selected in, uh, in making whiskey. In fact, there's other whiskeys that do like a 17 or even a 15, uh, excuse me, or even a uh, 14, for example. It's just when it's best produced for when it's ready. But originally when we produced or put out uh, our 18 year old, we have to look at marketing. This is where marketing really kind of comes in. For years, for a good 30 years, we've been telling everybody that 12 is good, 15 is great, 18 is better. It's just the, it's the easy numbers of, of kind of adding on top of each of the expressions over time. And now we're taking a step back and now that we've actually gotten a chance to work with some master blenders like uh, Greg Glass, for example, who does all of our whiskeys at Dura, who's taking a new approach. He's taking almost like Dr. Bill Lumpson, where he's taking on the science, the food science behind understanding how maturation and different types of casks work to find that, that, that perfect flavor. Uh, but when it comes to like, if we strategically marketed 18 in the Japanese area at, uh, at, in 2009, when we introduced, sorry, 2001, when we introduced this whiskey, we only had 5,000 bottles that we introduced around the world. Uh, during that time period. So really it was about more so just seeing what people thought, you know, do, do people enjoy it? Do they not? Because even if you look at, um, you know, today we see 18, 21, 25, 30, 35, 40, we see all these beautiful whiskeys, but a lot of people don't realize that it wasn't until right around the late nineties, early two thousands that we saw anything past the 12. Like we just didn't really see it. Not very often. It was there. But from, a, from a, especially in the United States, we didn't really see much more of those higher expressions. And finding that next level that like, if you like this one, you got to try this one kind of approach is really just skyrocketed what you see today. And now it's going into the specifics of the wood, not just the cask, but the wood itself. Like who is the cooper? Where did they source from? What is the process that they actually did to actually create the cask? What type of seasoning did they do outside in nature? Or if they did it internally in an actual warehouse? Uh, and you're going to see more and more and more of those, not just these are from Gonzalez Villas Winery, but you'll see from these are from Gonzalez Winery and also from, uh, um, you know, from, uh, from, from uh, another different type, type of or cooperage. I actually had the joy of going to, um, to, to Spain a couple of years ago and we got to go to Tavesa, which is an actual cooperage maker. So, and they are famous for having some of the most kind of like go-to specifics when making uh, casks for sherry production to be eventually turned into Scotch whiskey. And uh, I'm happy to say that because of the, um, 
uh, the relationships that Richard has cultivated over years, we're starting to see a new series, hasn't really made in the United States yet, but we're starting to see a new series of whiskeys that are coming out around the world that are specific to the actual cooperage, which is pretty fascinating. It's almost like you're getting more and more and more into that, that dive down the rabbit hole. Now, are they using one certain type of wood? Or are they switching it up? What, what's their plan on that? Uh, it really depends on the expression. But, uh, you know, predominantly, I, I think last I checked, uh, in Scotch whiskey, they're using 16 different types of, of uh, white French oak, uh, which is pretty amazing. In fact, Jura, which is one of our whiskeys as well, has one they call Seven Wood, which is finished in six distinctly different French new oak casks, uh, including Bauge, Trancé, uh, Allier, uh, uh, Lamousine, uh, um, Bauge. Each of these are going to be a different kind of subtle flavor characteristic, but it's something that's never been used in scotch before. So there's a lot of really exciting things that are coming down the pipeline. I, I, I tell this to people all the time. There's a bit of a revolution that's happening in scotch whiskey right now. And the younger generation of whiskey makers are really grabbing it and running with it, which is really exciting. So by that, like, are you using, like, each stave could be a different type of wood, or you're using different barrels and then blending them later? You know, that's a, that's a good point, and they are doing a combination of both. And it's really about, you know, excuse my language, because I know you're recording this, but it's really about fucking up. It's about experimenting and trying something new. So, I mean, there's nobody out there that can tell you what the whiskey is going to taste like in two years from a certain type of cask or toast or roast or any of those things. Uh, it's only with experience and like a great guesstimation that you're going to be able to find consistency. This is why in American whiskeys and in Scotch whiskeys, we do batching because each individual barrel has its own kind of personality that it is produced. Uh, and when we're looking at different types of casks, you know, we've actually got a whiskey that's, uh, that's, uh, it's, it was originally a Taiwanese exclusive, and we're just now toying with the idea of putting it out into the market. It's called our Sherry Cask Select. This is our 12-year-old that we put out around, uh, I, we've just introduced it in the United States, but unfortunately, it's uh, such small production that it's, always, it's, uh, it's gone to uh, only a, a couple or handful of different uh, retailers. Uh, but it's finished in these casks that are a combination between Oloroso and also PX finishes. So they'll age them separately and then they'll take these casks and they'll bring the staves together to create one unique style of cask. As I know of, nobody else has done that before. But it's about really just seeing what happens more than anything else. Thank you. Well, speaking about all these different finishes, and I think we probably should try that Portwood finish. Mm. So for those of you that have uh, had a chance to try these at home, we did not taste in the, uh, the sequence of price. And I really love to point that out because it's really about the personalities. You know, you want to start soft and kind of work your way up from there. And our Portwood, I never want to say there's a bang for your buck, but really this is your bang for your buck whiskey. <laughs> like it is you, just- You have no favorites, uh, no favorite children, and there's no bang for your buck, except for there is. It, it, yeah, exactly. Don't quote me on that one. I mean, I'm being recorded, so I guess I have no choice. But we're starting to see a kind of a change, like I was talking about with the different style of staves and the different types of casks and the different uh, species of French white oak and even American white oak that we're using in, uh, in making, uh, making whiskeys and that we're experimenting with. We're also working with other different types of producers. Now, if you think it's hard to find true sherry casks in Spain, Try to go to Portugal, which is about a tenth of the size of the country, and the growing region, the Doral Valley, is much, much, much smaller than even Jerez de la Frontera in Spain. And the, uh, the port casks, which are starting to see more and more port finishes. Uh, but the question you need to ask is what type of port and who is the producer? Again, this is where Richard Patterson really shows that one-to-one -one relationship, because as far as that I'm aware of, we're the only producers in Scotland that use specific casks, W&J Grams, which is arguably one of the best and biggest producers of port in the world, as well as Tani port casks, not Ruby port casks. Hmm. So that I know of, there's only two whiskeys that are coming out of Scotland that are part of a mainline extension uh, that use Tani port casks, and that's going to be the Dalmore Portwood and the Balvini 21-year-old. That I know of, that's it. So there's a a uh, distillery across the street, apparently, that, that did a Portwood, and that was pretty influential to the market. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. 
the Quinta Ruban. This is going to be from Glenmore NG. And the Quinta Ruban is going to be out of Ruby Ports. That's why it's called Ruban. So when you're looking at those style of the cask, it's pretty easy to get a Ruby cask, but it's really difficult to get tawny. Because when you're making fortified wines, the older the cask, the more coveted it is. So for example, if we went to W&J Grams and we said, well, you know, we don't want to make your, we don't want to make this style of whiskey anymore. Thank you for your partnership. They aren't going to go look for somebody else to partner with. The fact that Richard has the re reputation that he does and his, uh, his uh, continuous search for quality and uh, over quantity has really kind of led his reputation where people that would normally not work with other whiskey producers will work with Richard. So the fact that we're able to actually source directly from WJ Grams is, 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 uh, is huge. It's like getting um, a first right and refusal for front row tickets to any concert you want to go to for the rest of your life. It's huge. Yeah. Uh, and especially in the whiskey world, people would absolutely kill for the barrel programs that we put together at Dalmore. But it also showcases why White and Mackay, um, out of the last five years, twice was named uh, Whiskey Producers of the Year. So if you were leading somebody through a tasting on this particular scotch, how would you differentiate, like clearly the port? And it's tawny specifically, so you're getting less of that red berry, that wine flavor. Uh, what are the advantages to using the tawny? I understand it's older, but it, some folks might consider that a disadvantage. Like you're not getting those red berry notes. So what is the advantage of it? Yeah, you're going to get more, uh, like, for example, you know, I tried it uh, earlier this evening when we made the old fashioned, you know, the cherries that I used are going to be the filthy black cherries, you know, mar maraschino specifically, like when you open this up and you smell it, you're going to get sweet and you're going to get sour at the same time. And that's a lot of those same like sour cherries and also that's that slight molasses -y characteristic that you get from, uh, from, uh, from marinating for so long in, in these, these simples that they use. Uh, same thing with like maraschino, for example, excuse me, uh, uh, yeah, maraschino cherries that you also get from, from Luxardo, for example. A lot of sweet and just bitter on the back end. Those sweet and sour cherries are just a beautiful combination. So you're going to get a lot more of those deeper, richer, just like if you were trying the 12 versus the 18, you know, it's going to have a lot more of that body to it itself. You're going to get a lot more plum notes. You're going to get a lot more uh, uh, fig notes on a tawny versus a ruby. Ruby, you're going to get a lot more almost like sugar or demerara type flavors. You're gonna get uh, also some of the bright fruits instead of you're gonna get more of that blueberry, that blackberry note. Uh, and it also doesn't have a huge finish. You know, with, with Tani, it's a big, rich, full finish, it just coats the palate. And we're using casks that are from the Solera system, which are anywhere between 70 and 100 years old. They've had a lot of port sitting in them for a very, very, very long time. Uh, so it's just, it's, uh, it comes down to the richness of the overall whiskey. You know, one of the biggest criticisms that we've gotten from Dalmore is that we don't have a high proof whiskey. Now, Portwood is 93 proof. It's a big whiskey. But most of our whiskeys are between 80 proof and 86 to 88 proof. Because we have such beautifully rich casks, we don't necessarily need to have that big alcohol because it would just be overwhelming. It'd be a lot of flavor all at once. So with the Portwood, I always say this is kind of like the bourbon catalyst. So if you love bourbon, you're probably going to enjoy this one because it's a little bit higher proof, 93 proof or 46.5% alcohol. It's also going to start off in bourbon casks. You're still going to have that vanilla, that caramel, the baking spice, but it's going to have that beautiful, almost like maraschino cherry, uh, fig notes. You know, you can almost get to like that fig Newton kind of like characteristic on the back of the palate as well. So this one is such a beautiful, beautiful whiskey. And especially if you're looking at it as that perfect all the way rounded whiskey, this is definitely a great one to have in your house. So I hope you enjoy this one. Try it neat, add a few drops of water and you really see some of those the fig notes that are really kind of open up on this one. Does anybody try to use Australian Tony or is that just not an AF? Have the kind of barrel selection y'all need? Uh, you know, I think uh, that's a great question. And honestly, I don't know the, the true answer to that one. I'm going to have to do a little bit more research. But a lot of it comes down to consistency because chain supply is a real issue around the world, not just for whiskey or not just for port or even different types of casks. Uh, so finding that consistent source and that consistent partner that you can utilize over time. I mean, 
WJ, uh, 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 WJ Grams, we've worked with them for over 30 years. You know, when we're looking at Gonzalez Villas, we have a relationship on paper that goes all the way back to 1915. Before that, it was on a handshake back to 1865. So really cultivating those long-term friendships and also working relationships is a big part of the overall success. Marlon, I saw your hand, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Oh, no, no, please, not at all. Um, so, you know, I think it, it comes down to the supply chain at the end of the day, right? Um, because we're so far removed from Australia, I think on a consistent basis, utilizing something like uh, a Australian tawny might not make the most sense, but there are definitely Aust uh, distilleries in Australia that have done that and uh, have done that quite successfully. All right. The um, Australian wine market, you know, if you go back 40, 50 years, it was predominantly fortified wines. Now, you know, everybody in the world knows of Shiraz, uh, uh, the, you know, big Australian wines and the huge market. But I'm also of the impression, maybe uh, Marlon, having lived on that side of the world, maybe you can correct me. But I was under the impression that their fortified wine market had kind of decreased as their kind of still wine market has, has ascended. Uh, yeah, no, that's my, that's my impression as well. So um, I, I, be, I believe that to be true. However, there is still a domestic market um, for, for those uh, fortified wines. Um, so from what I understand, there are some distillers in Australia that are making use of uh, the fortified wine casks. Cool. Yeah. Um, so any favorites tonight so far? I mean, it's, uh, it's, uh, I'm putting you on the spot. I'm, I'm asking for your favorite child tonight. Um, are you asking us? Yeah, of uh, course. I, mean, I consider uh, you guys. I, I consider you guys the my 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 tasting panel. I, I see Curtis and Patty back there. You guys are having a good time, so I'd love to hear your feedback on this as well. Uh, I always like drinking on Sand and Shine, so I always like all the products. Uh, I think I think I'm more <laughs> partial to the 15. I, I think the 15 to me. I, I like. I'm not trying to diss any of them, but this one kind of just hit home. Was like, oh, this is. Uh, an after lunch uh, kind of scotch. And once again, <laughs> that really forever known as the after lunch uh, scotch. I, I'm I'm glad that's catching on. <laughs> Marvin, yeah. I thought I was mad at you because I couldn't pronounce your name, but now I realize I'm actually mad at you for incentivizing my employees to drink in the afternoon. <laughs> lunches, I don't think that's Three possible. Lunches. I think Marlon, you're going to start a new hashtag. It's going to be after lunch whiskey. <laughs> yeah, you get all the credit for it. <laughs> oh man! Yeah, okay. All we have, all we have is the tw all we have is the twelve. Unfortunately, I'll I'll have a better tasting tomorrow when I get to stop by. Well, hopefully uh, next time that we get a chance to do this, I'll be in person with you guys yes. in North Carolina, so we can actually uh, do a proper tasting and uh, spend some time really diving into the specifics because it's it's uh, it's it's fun doing these these avenues because we get to have special guests like Marlon come on. Oh, please. What are you talking about? I'll come to the tasting North Carolina. Oh, hell yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you can get us both for the price of one. There we go. That's my <laughs> sales pitch. You, um, you said you've been, you had a, res a relationship with Porthouse for 30 years. How long have you all been making a port with finish? So we've had a number of, of different port finishes that we've done over time. Uh, in fact, when we start getting into our rare whiskeys, this is where we start seeing some of those really exclusive individual casks. Uh, for example, we've got a collection called Constellation, uh, which is 21 unique whiskeys that are all barrels, that are all natural color, natural strength, and they all range from anywhere from a 1991 all the way down to a 1964. So they've got all different types of cask finishes and personalities, and we see quite a few of the port finishes in those particular whiskeys. Uh, even in our 35, our 40, and our 45, we start seeing some of those cojareta or specific vintage port casks that we've been using uh, to age some of our really high-end expressions. So the biggest issue has always been able to get a consistent flow of casks. And it's only within the last, I think, four years that we've had a mainline extension using those tiny port casks. So the port wood is the newest out of all of our whiskeys. It's also the first one out of our main line to not use sherry, uh, which is pretty exceptional as well. So like if we try our 40 year old, 
It's actually a combination between 30-year-old uh, Methuselah casks that we get from the 1970s, as well as uh, from uh, <clears throat> uh, 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 W.J. Graham's specific Coharetta selected casks that Richard has picked out personally. Um, in, in cognac, uh, you mentioned Remy a minute ago, you know, they famously have these, these, uh, sort of these and these actual finished brandies that are forever old, but they often take the juice out of the barrel for a number of reasons, uh, either flavor, but also barrel isn't going to be sound <laughs> if we do it six decades. Yeah. And then they'll, they'll, they'll store them in glass. Uh, when, you're, when you're talking about these whiskey expressions that are 30, 40, 45 years old, are you all doing that as well? Are you removing it from wood contact at all? No? No, we're going to leave it in wood contact. It usually kind of changes from cask to cask to cask. Uh, we've got casks just like in cognac, especially if you're looking at like Louis Trez, for example. Uh, it stops getting its flavor after about 40 years. And then the rest of that time is about resting and really kind of really grilling that maturity. So they put them in what we call insulate casks. So these are just basically resting casks. These are casks that are designed specifically not to really give any personality, color, or flavor, but more so to let the actual whiskeys or cognacs just really settle in and breathe and just really find that level of... Uh, of uh, ensemblage, I guess you would say, of flavors to kind of really give you that balance that we're looking for down the road. Because at a certain point, we don't want more flavor because it's just going to be too much in your face, especially if it's going to be natural proof right off of the actual cask. Okay. Well, I think we have time for, um, you taste it a lot. Maybe yeah. we, should, uh, we should have another drink then. Yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> that seems reasonable. Everyone's home. Yeah, we're gonna make a jive ho, which is, uh, it's always been available as Alley. Uh, but we're gonna go through uh, three fourths ounce of Grand Bowie, three fourths ounce of pineapple demerara syrup, three fourths ounce of lime juice, and an ounce and a half of Dalmore 12 years. So for those who like drinking scotch and scotch cocktails, um, that ratio of scotch to Drambuie should look really, really familiar. Uh, you know, it's just the ultimate old man drink, you know, it's a rusty nail. And then pineapple, uh, who would have thought pineapple and scotch? Oh yeah, that's right, all of us. Um, so, and Demerara, as you mentioned, so we got the best of both worlds. We stuck pineapple and Demerara in the same syrup. That's the ultimate scotch loving syrup. I used to, uh, when I worked in the, uh, the service industry still, I used to, I always used to always volunteer to grill the pineapples for one of our scotch cocktails that we did. Because it just makes such a beautiful, it's almost like it's like this creme brulee of flavors. You're just like toasting that sugar right on top. It's just so much fun. Yes. Uh, we, I, we had some extra pineapple. We're not open currently on two days a week. So on a Sunday night, we had some extra pineapple garnish and I, I used the torch on it. Um, qu question, do you, do you guys have uh, Jura at the bar? We do not currently have Jura at the bar. Uh, so that's, not, that's an opportunity right there because I think pineapple and Jura is the absolute perfect combination. Grilled pineapple or just regular pineapple? I, I, I like the cans. I mean, I, you know, I come from the bar background, like, like Ben mentioned. Uh, you know, I worked, I worked behind the bar for many years. And... Um, the cans do, do, do the trick. Obviously, if you work in a very fancy bar like you guys do, maybe like fresh pineapple would, fresh pineapple juice would be, uh, is also a good addition. Um, but yeah, the, the Jura and pineapple is just an absolute winning combination to me. It's, it's like that on the beach, pulled pork sandwich, Caribbean kind of vibe, and it just, it works really well. I think you had us at pulled pork sandwich. <laughs> Standing. So we're going to do like a, we're going to do a reverse dry shake here. So we like to shake the drinks. Uh, we like to shake the drink first, then add the egg white, shake again, and then pour. Which I understand is the reverse of what we used to do when we were making egg white drinks a decade ago. 
Yeah. So it's, uh, <clears throat> I mean, because when I used to bartend, I used to always do a dry shake just to kind of get that froth. So why is it that you do it the opposite now? Well, a few reasons. Uh, one, actually, when you put the egg in a cold fluid, it froths faster. Uh, but honestly, I told everybody, you know, the first gazillion years I was doing this, that um, the egg white's not for flavor, it's for texture. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like a meringue. And then I realized I've never um, whisked meringue warm. <laughs> I always do that cold, so why wouldn't I? It didn't, and they, so after a couple of days of really, really, really unpleasant muscle memory breaking, uh, and I was able to figure this out, I've never, we've never looked back. It, it's just a better way to do it. Or it's right, so, so if George is still on here, I don't see, I don't see George anymore. But uh, George, we're gonna have to go when I'm coming to town for sure. Sorry, Jeff. Yeah. Okay, so we're literally just going to crack this right over the tin, as you often see. Ah, oh yes, we break it into the tin without the liquid in it, <laughs> just in case, you know, for the same reason we, uh, when Ben was making that drink, he said, start with the smallest ingredients first, you know, add the, add the booze last, <laughs> mm -hmm. safety expensive. first. Let's not, let's not mess up our booze. Yeah, no scotch was harmed in the, make, in the messing up of any of these drinks, uh, which we haven't messed up. I'll get you some. There you go. Really, the only reason to do these drinks is to watch uh, Luke do this. There you go. <laughs> Patented crab shake. First goes from the pistons to the crab. It's you know effortless, effortless transition. There you go to the, like I'm still mad about that parking ticket. There you go. <laughs> it's all about bean shakes here. Outstanding. Oh, that's good. I mean, they're all the same, but that middle one's mine. Outstanding. And then, uh, of course, segueing on that uh, Christmas spice uh, conversation we had, uh, we're going to we'll go ahead and uh, finish these drinks with just a little Angostura on top. Where, where do all the display drinks go? Cheers to drive home. Cheers, you guys. Appreciate it. Mm, I, I appreciate that you're taking care of your camera woman as well. Oh, yeah. Oh, I thought that cocktail was for me. <laughs> <laughs> Claire's actually the uh, behind the scenes everything. <laughs> it's not just the, as you know from the run of show notes and all of the exchanges. Uh, regarding she uh it does all the heavy the real boss as yeah. it is i found out really quickly working in operations there's the guy who runs the business or the woman who runs the business but there's really there's the real boss that actually runs the overall people that work there i found that out. i used to work at the four uh the four seasons in chicago and uh, i took over as the room service director uh this is when i first was in the management i was in my early 20s and I had my director of F&B and I also had the hotel director as well. But I found out really quickly that the lady who ran everything ran the PBX station or the order taker. If, I, if, if she believed in what I was doing, everything ran smoothly. If it, she didn't, 
everything was chaos. It was amazing. It was a hard lesson to learn, but it was an amazing lesson. There's the people that pull the strings and there's the people that actually have the title. So I'm going to, I'm going to say that she definitely pulls the strings. Well, we would agree with you. Hey, Ben, if I could ask uh, one more question on aging, uh, you know, when we think about like Kentucky bourbon, you think about those wild temperature fluctuations. So like, there's a lot of breathing, a lot of in and out, but you also lose a lot on that end. Uh, now in Scotland, you think of, I think of a lot less of a temperature flux. How much are you losing per year? And is, is there ever like when you open, say a 30, 40 year old barrel that there's just nothing? You know, I would, um, I would say it comes down to a combination of taxation and reality. So in the United States, we lose anywhere between four and 6% of the liquid each year. So based on that particular ratio and taxes, you actually pay your taxes accordingly. In Scotland, it's about two to 3% that we're losing legally each year. So some of the better producers will actually get it down to about 2%. So they're paying less taxes to lose uh, less liquid, which is actually uh, kind of always the overall uh, scope that we're looking at. But then also, Atmosphere makes a big difference. I mean, if you're looking at like, um, uh, uh, um, you know, whiskeys that you see from around the world, depending on where they're at, if they're in, you know, if they're in, uh, if they're in Thailand, if they're in Korea, if they're in Scotland, if they're in the United States, if they're in Tasmania, you know, how much of that angel share happens each, each year is going to be different based on climate. So in Scotland, it's wet. In fact, peat became famous in Scotland because really it's a cold atmosphere and they don't really have many trees. So they burned what they could. And that just so happened to be plant matter. So where that peat comes from will also affect the overall flavor of the whiskey as well as the household. I always say it's kind of like walking into a cigar bar. You can walk in for two seconds and walk out and you smell like a cigar bar. That's what peat does to the actual whiskey. So depending on where the peat comes from around, the, uh, around Scotland, is really gonna give you those flavor components that go along with the whiskey. So it, even when looking at like Angel Share, for example, most of our barrels are right on the ground. And if you see pictures of Rick houses in Scotland, you'll notice if you look at the ground, it's dirt. So they have two by fours that they roll the barrels out and they usually do no more than about three barrels high. And they do that because they wanna get a lot of the natural elements from the earth itself. They wanna let the, like the whiskey breathe. In comparison to the United States, where you'll see them go up anywhere between 10 and 15 barrels high, you know, three or four story warehouses. Uh, and it's important for us to really get the natural, uh, the natural elements of the atmosphere that it's around or the terroir specific, because it really gives the personality characteristics of the actual whiskey. Just think of like lowland versus highland you know, the, uh, the ground or the, uh, the vegetation is very different and so are the whiskeys. Lowland whiskeys traditionally are much softer in comparison to Highland whiskeys, which are a little bit more, uh, a little bit more personality and a little bit bigger personality. Even though both of them at some point may do multiple maturation, the flavors are very different. So when you have something that's sitting for, you know, 10, 12, 14 years at a lower temperature, you're not gonna see as much that liquids moving around as you would say like Kentucky, where the temperature goes from freezing to like 120 degrees. You know, some, some of those warehouses can get upwards of 180 degrees at the very top of the warehouses. So there's, that's why when you see batching from bourbons, they'll say this is the, like the pappies of the world are the bottom floor because the liquid isn't turning nearly as much as the ones on the very top floor. Uh, so that's good and bad. It just really depends on how you're actually producing the actual whiskeys. But three barrels high for us really gives us a chance to really get a lot of the natural elements and also to kind of like let those whiskeys kind of sit and turn slowly. So if you try a three-year-old Scotch whiskey compared to a three-year-old American whiskey, they're going to be very, very different because of the climate. If you try uh, an American, uh, if you try an American whiskey that's from the northern region, a little bit, a little bit cooler area, it's going to take a little bit longer. Versus if you make your whiskeys in, like, say, Texas. Sure. So, if you want to get a little bit nuts about it, so it's already an alchemist kind of approach to making, you know, this, uh, this uh, uskabre, this water of life, and then you throw the wood characteristic into it as well, and then you throw the climate into it and then you throw the warehouses into it. It's like the fact that our master blenders aren't absolutely crazy is just, is mind blowing because there's so much what if characteristics that are out there 
with making whiskey that a lot of people don't realize. There's no recipe for making a particular whiskey. A lot of it is just pure dumb luck, as well as expertise and also just, uh, you know, having a, a, a rough or good understanding of how to actually produce a style of whiskey you're looking for. Lessons learned. Yeah. A lot. Outstanding. Well, uh, we have taken a goodly amount of your time. <laughs> well, you can tell I like doing this stuff, so. Well, we appreciate yeah. that, Ben and Marlon. Thank you very much. Uh, sincerely appreciate it. Um, we're going to continue to do these week, week to week. I believe our guest next week is, is Lynn House from Heaven Hill. She's there. Um, mm -hmm. For those who are watching the series, you remember uh, Bernie, Bernie and Connor, Connor from a little bit ago. Uh, that the uh, global brand ambassador and master distiller, and now we're going to have their kind of head of education. I think is her national brand title. educator. National brand educator. That's mm -hmm. great. So hopefully she'll bring to the series the things that y'all have brought tonight, which is a depth of knowledge that we've really appreciated picking your brains. Mm -hmm. uh, and you being game for this is really great. And I'll say what we said to them: we can't wait to do this in person. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, if you want to follow me at all on Instagram, you can follow me. I just put it in the text messages so you can see it in the chat room. It's at whiskey without an E underscore Benjamin. Just make sure it's without an E. Um, but uh, if... Uh, country, you? What's that? You'd be, in a, you'd be representing the wrong country with an E, wouldn't you? That's true. It's true. Uh, you know, it's funny. People always ask, why E without an E? And, uh, you know, a lot of it comes down to Irish versus Scottish identity more than anything. Uh, even in, uh, <clears throat> even if you look at American whiskeys, you know, they're like, oh, American whiskeys has an E, but Maker's Mark doesn't have an E. So really there's no wrong answer. There isn't one that's better than you. If you look at the laws from the uh, 1890s, if you look at those laws, whiskey is spelled with and without an E, depending on who was writing it. So yeah, I can, I can see some identity politics going in there yeah you know ultimately it comes down to president taft i mean i think he's the one that wrote it with the e in the actual legislation so maybe that's what it is i mean what else did he do like we don't you know. he, uh, name anything else he's done i i, I would i'm I, i'd love to see some like american president historians jump in on this one i think he is famous for something else but we're not going to talk about that <laughs> <laughs> well I want to say thank you to everybody for joining us this evening. Marlon and I are, are you know, we love what we do. And uh, if, if, uh, if you spend a lot of time working in the industry that you hate, then you need to change it. This is what he and I have both have done over time. Uh, you know, you, you have to start at whiskey tasting the same, or end the whiskey tasting the same way you start with a beautiful toast. So I want to raise a glass to everybody over at LA26, as well as uh, everybody who's been part of the actual tasting tonight. It's been a real pleasure. I've enjoyed it a lot. But uh, there, this is my this is my last toast of the evening. So there are good ships, and there are wood ships and ships that sail the sea. <laughs> but the best ships, of course, as you know, are friendships, and may they always be. Slanjava. Slanjava. So I mean, uh, if you guys want to stick around and ask any questions, if anyone wants to come off a of mute, or you know, if they want to get on camera. We're here to have a good conversation. Marlon and I, you know, I have never done a training. I've had a lot of great conversations, so. Anybody want to take them up on that? We can even talk about chocolate if you want to. <laughs> you know, I, so Japan didn't come out with like a legal definition of what their whiskey is until the first of this month, if I'm correct. It's not even legal. Hmm. It's, still, it's not illegal. It's, it's an association. It's an, yeah, it's a panel, just like in Japan. Yeah. So is that, do you, I know that there are scotch companies that have been mass producing and selling into Japan as Japanese whiskey, but is that looked at as kind of like the bubbles and bond act of like, hey, we need to wrap this up and kind of get some clarity to what we're producing? I, I would say it's a combination of uh, clarity as well as history. Because if, uh, okay, let's, let's break down whiskey as a, as, a, as a category. Whiskey is a poor man's drink. 
It was made by your farmers. It was made by whatever grains that you had available. So in Scotland, for example, it was malt and it was wheat. If you go to Canada, it's rye. If you go to the United States, it's corn. So if you go to places like Japan or even India or even Indonesia, what do they grow more than anything else that's a, that's a cereal grain? It's rice. So, you know, Masa Asataki, who brought the, the process of making basically Scotch whiskey to Japan after spending about four years in Scotland learning the process and the technique, basically brought Scotch whiskey to Japan. So there's a big fight that's happening right now, and you're seeing it all kind of, a, you know, translating out in uh, the different associations that are out there about what is Japanese whiskey specifically. You know, I'm in the camp of like where you're from is what it should be. What you grow should be, you know, considered as long as you have yeast, water, and, uh, and cereal grain in the combination, that's really what all whiskey is. And then you had fermentation or you had the distillation on the end of it. Um, so I'm curious to see what kind of like specific characteristics come out of it because the process of what Masataki brought over to, to uh, Japan is basically Scotch whiskey. They're using Scottish stills, they're using Scottish grain, and in some cases they're using Scottish whiskey. So I'm curious to see what comes out of all of these. I'm just gonna wait for the dust to settle a little bit more. Because there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff that is being called Japanese that is not Japanese. Right. Well that's what the um, that's what this this uh, agreement, I guess. <laughs> it's not even it's not a law. Uh, it's this agreement among the major producers of Japanese whiskeys about uh, the kind of defining what those words are and from what you're talking about like if, if they're bottling things from other places they can call it world whiskey but they can't call it Japanese whiskey mm -hmm. unless it's mashed fermented distilled and bottled in country mm -hmm. yep uh, but that's once again if you're not a member of that association you're not legally bound to that so if you're exactly. not Suntory or Nika or one of the 30 other Distilleries that are part of that association, you're not. There's no legal. But I thought rice got left out of that. Exactly, rice. It did. It did. So I'm personally in the in the camp of like, if you're going to take a technique, especially if you're looking at sochu, or even uh, atamore, which is uh, you know, it's a distillate that is fermented that comes off of the actual grains and then distilled. It's a process to where instead of putting it into clay pots, you put it into barrels. And like if you go to like um, uh, um, Okinawa, for example where they use black koji, you know, they do a double fermentation and they do one dis uh, they do a double fermentation and one distillation. It still falls within the guidelines of what it is to make whiskey, which is water, yeast, and, and, uh, and cereal grain. Right. But because it's a technique that's over 600 years, I still don't, don't think it's right to kind of exclude it from tradition, especially since Japanese is all about tradition. Yeah. But that's my two cents. You know, that's my own, that's only my opinion. I can tell you now that none of the distilleries in Japan give a rat's ass about what I have to say, but <laughs> we can debate it. Is uh, we can debate it for 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 just for fun's sake, for sure. Yeah. Anybody else have uh, questions in the um, comment section? Yes. Did you guys say in making the royal stag that you could substitute demerara syrup for agave? Yeah, I use, uh, I use agave when I make the royal stag, but you can use demerara as well. Uh, you can use, uh, even if you wanted to use something that's infused, like the, the beautiful uh, syrups that they obviously have uh, available for, uh, for you guys as well. Uh, it just really kind of gives you a different, as long as you build off of the base, you can kind of make your own creation off of anything you want. I mean, a riff is basically just taking an original idea and just adding on top of it. I mean, a good barman is basically an alchemist. They're taking the original uh, process of making the distillate and they're adding on top of the actual flavors because that's what a whiskey maker does too. So yes, long answer. Yes, short answer. Any uh, other questions? Curtis, what do you got for me? I know you got some good questions. Uh, yeah, out of questions. I don't know. <laughs> okay. What have you done to Patty? She's like ethereal. 
it, it's the filter, right? I'm trying, I'm actually, unfortunately, I'm trying to work. I've got my work. Ah, <laughs> yeah. really yeah. Think, so. in the of the bottle. Wow. <laughs> Out of the bottle. Yeah. She is, she is Curtis's genie in the bottle. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's how I've always thought of it, Ben. Well, no, thank you, Shannon. <laughs> well, I guess uh, if nobody okay. else has questions, then we will once again say yeah. adieu. Appreciate all of your time, Ben, and, and of course, and everybody Marlin. that's, yes. uh, and Marlon, of course, and everybody that is tuned in, like Patty and Curtis and Randy repeatedly. Um, always great to have you, and tell your friends if they missed it, they didn't miss it. It's up online uh, where you can tune in to Ben profaning and uh, <laughs> claiming to uh, not really be neutral when it comes to whether or not he's got favorites um, forever. You're, you're going to get me fired, aren't you? I, I see this already. <laughs> I, yeah, I was going for that job. So well, that, we're not how going do I get your job? I get you fired, right? <laughs> we're, we're not going for that job, but 15 was our favorite. I'm just saying. Yeah. All right. So, I mean, if, uh, if, uh, if, uh, if I lose my job, I'm, I'm looking for a good bar back position. I'm just saying. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If you don't like that 18, I'll take it off your hands. What was that, Kurt? If you don't like that 18, I'll take it off your hands tomorrow. Oh, no, no, no. I didn't say I didn't like it. <laughs> no, sir. You can, well, you just can like can making great cocktails, you want to have great ingredients. So I hope you enjoy the Dalmore, uh, especially the Dalmore 12. You know, even if you want to look at some of our other expressions, like the cigar malts, which is uh, almost like the big brother of the 15. So if you like the 15, you're going to love the cigar malts. Uh, really pulls on the natural tannic characteristics of, of uh, first growth Bordeaux. So it makes fun cocktails. I actually had a, um, a coconut milk old fashioned with, with, uh, with cigar malt and it was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. Yeah. I mean, you look at it and you're like, I'm not drinking this, but then you try it and you're like, oh my God, this is amazing. Oh, yeah. Coconut yeah. and scotch, just like pineapple and scotch. Exactly. Like together. Yeah. Well, if you ever make it to the Isle of Jura, they do have one palm tree on island. That's all you need. <laughs> exactly. You just put a chair underneath it and a little tiki hat, and you're good. <laughs> oh, yeah. So I, I'll, before I let you go, and I'm going to let you go in a hot second, did, did Jura used to be owned by a different company? Jura, yes. So Jura um, has been with White & Mackay, which is obviously our parent company. Uh, for roughly about 20 years now. But prior to that, it was actually owned by Beam. Uh, okay. Beam was a big owner of our, of, our, of our products. We also had Victoria, which owned our, our distillery for a while as well. Uh, but Jura, which is an island whiskey, it's just north of I Love. It's about twice the size of Manhattan and same kind of shape. But instead of 3 million people, we've got 200 people. Okay. So it is, it's, uh, it's beautiful. It's kind of like, I've been to a lot of distilleries where you drive up, you go in the visitor center, you go through the whole experience, the tasting room, you go to the gift shop and then you leave. With Jura, you do that same thing, but then once you walk out of the actual distillery, you have the whole island to yourself. There's only one distillery and it's all shaped around the actual distillery. It's an absolutely breathtaking and exceptional uh, uh, experience. But as George Orwell said, because he used to live up on the islands, it's one of the most get in edible places in the world. So it takes a little bit of time to get there. But once you're there, it's exceptional. Okay. Yeah. Well, I haven't visited Scotland yet, but it's on my to-do list. You know, after those long afternoon lunches followed by scotch. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, let me know when you do go, because maybe I'll join you. That'll be fun. Perfect. Yeah. Done. Good. We'll see you in yeah. Miami first, but then it's on to Scotland. Yeah. Please, you're always welcome in Miami. So please, by all means. So anybody else as well. My information is already in the actual chat. So if you want to reach out to me directly in individual questions, don't hesitate. Don't feel like, uh, you know, intimidation whatsoever. It's, uh, you know, I, I like to enjoy and, and answer any questions I can. Well, Except you can't, can't wait to have a dram with you at Churchill's, a fine establishment. Uh, or here at our own bar. Oh, yeah, here at, at, uh, at we're gonna Alley do 26. We're going to do a whiskey and a chocolate tasting. Oh, yeah, whiskey chocolate Ooh. taste right yep. here. Yep. We've got some beautiful chocolates that we've actually partnered with uh, 12, 15, and 18. So we got to do that next time. Absolutely. Done. For lunch? For lunch. After lunch. After you gonna open, when are you going to open for lunch, Shannon? <laughs>
Oh, soon. When the staff. Soon. When we when, when, when you Google, start when, bar backing, I will have enough staff. Yeah. yeah when when Google shows up, you open for lunch, right? What was that? When Google shows up, you open for lunch, right? When Google shows up, we open for lunch. A thousand when people Apple downtown. Google, are we still waiting on that? No. Uh, honestly, <laughs> Apple and Google can show up, but if they don't show up with barbacks and waiters, yeah. I still can't open for lunch. Well, that's true. That's very true. <laughs> One fan, final thank you to Ben. We're yes, going to let you all very much. Up, yeah, please do reach, so much. Out to, reach out to us. Any questions, mm -hmm. even if you're seeing this months from now on the uh, on the YouTube's. Thank you very much, and thanks, and thank you, Marlon, for for being such a a, a great resource. Yep. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you very much. Appreciate it, everybody. At LA26. Cheers. Cheers.